Welcome to Hence the Future podcast. I'm Adam Morconin, and today we're discussing the future of inflation. Specifically, we'll be looking at seven inflation indicators for 2021 that will give us a sense of how we should expect prices to rise in the coming months and the coming years. And at the end of the episode, we will also look at what the best assets might be for protecting yourself against inflation. Let's start with the official inflation numbers as reported by the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics. So our first indicator is that inflation jumped to 4.2% in 2021, the highest level seen since the 2008 Great Recession. And the Fed always wants inflation to be 2% or lower. That's what they see as a sign of a healthy economy. Anything over 2% is considered a warning signal for the economy. It's worth noting that this 4.2% inflation estimate by the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics is based on CPI, which is the Consumer Price Index, and that doesn't include things like food and energy prices, which are considered volatile. Some critics point out that the CPI may be a bit arbitrary as far as what is included and what is not, so it is open to potential manipulation. So there is some doubt about how much faith we should put in the official inflation metrics. And just judging this metric alone, 4.2% is certainly higher than we would like it to be, but it's not so alarming. If 4.2% is the true inflation number, it is something that we can certainly come back from. It's really that if it is much higher than that, and if it goes above 5, 10, 15, 20%, that's when you start to really worry about runaway inflation types of scenarios. Now let's get into indicator number two, Google Trends. Our second indicator is that Google search interest for the word inflation is the highest it's ever been in the history of Google search. Now this doesn't necessarily mean that inflation has happened or is happening. It only means that people are very curious about whether inflation is happening. But this can easily become a self-fulfilling prophecy. If enough people expect inflation to happen and prices to rise, then inflation will happen and prices will rise. Indicator number three, the price of wood. Our third indicator is that lumber prices rose from $343 in May 2020 to over $1,600 in May 2021. That's nearly a 400% price increase in just the past year. And analysts predict it could go even higher, especially if there is a particularly intense wildfire season that reduces supply even more. We could see prices go above $2,000 per 1,000 foot board of lumber. Like many industries, the lumber and forestry industry was heavily affected by COVID. Many lumber mills had to shut down operations when the pandemic started. And now that the pandemic is nearing the end and people are vaccinated, demand for building homes and for renovating their current homes is sky high, especially with the work from home trend, with remote learning, with people wanting outdoor spaces where they can feel safe with other people and that they're not gonna have as much of a chance of catching any kind of virus. The demand for houses has far outpaced demand for many other assets. And the final reason why the price of wood has risen so quickly, perhaps before even other prices have risen, is because you can't fake real wood. With something like wood, especially that's used in actual construction and not just used for speculation, you cannot manipulate that market very much. So when there is not enough supply to meet demand, and especially when there's a lot of easy money in the system, a lot of quantitative easing, a lot of increase in the monetary supply, then a lot of those hard assets get bought up first. Indicator number four, housing prices. Our fourth indicator we touched on already because it's very closely related to the price of lumber. And that is that the price of a home is rising at the fastest rate in 15 years. And not only is this being driven by the work from home trend, the remote learning trend, the desire people have to have some outdoor space, it's also being driven by people flocking to hard assets where people who expect some inflation to happen in the future are trying to put all their cash that they have in their savings or in their reserves into a home, into a physical, tangible asset. And the fact that interest rates are so low right now means that people who already own homes are incentivized to refinance their homes and keep their homes rather than to sell them. So people that might normally be selling their home in a scenario where there's higher interest rates are actually holding on to their homes and waiting for the prices to rise even more. So there simply are not enough homes to meet demand right now in the market. And another sub indicator for this is that there are currently more realtors 
in the US, then there are homes for sale in the US. And that's a sign that the housing market is seriously heating up. And there are two types of philosophies about this right now. Some people very much feel that because houses are something always people are going to need, people always need a roof over their head, they always need shelter, then it makes sense right now to put money into a home, even though prices are sky high. The other school of thought is that we might be in a serious housing bubble and prices might seriously fall in the future, especially if there is more construction of new housing, maybe with Biden's infrastructure bill, or if demand wanes a little bit, and then if prices go down in 2022 or 2023. Indicator number five, gas prices. Gas prices are currently at the highest they've been since 2014. That means they're over $3 per gallon nationally. And in some places, I even saw in LA, it was over $6 per gallon. And recently there was the Colonial Pipeline cyber attack. This is the pipeline that supplies many states in the US from Texas to Delaware. And there was a ransomware attack where they essentially shut down this entire service and required some payment in order for them to turn it back on. Now, there was some panic buying that immediately followed this. People put gas into different containers. Some people even put it into plastic bags. And eventually they resolved this hack. And now the Colonial Pipeline is back up and running. But even since then, there has been higher gas prices than we've seen for many years now. Part of this is also related to the pandemic. People are traveling again. People are going on road trips. They're moving about the country. They're flying on planes. So that is one reason why gas prices are higher. Also, the OPEC, which controls most of the world's oil reserves, has been pretty tight as far as how they've controlled the supply of oil recently. And people are very much expecting there to be more green initiatives to come from the Biden-Harris administration. And perhaps no longer will we be subsidizing oil and gas and fossil fuels. And so it might be that the gas companies are charging more while everyone still pretty much drives gas cars before the transition really happens to electric cars. And contrary to some of the other indicators, I think there's a pretty powerful silver lining here, which is that for the first time ever, electric cars are becoming more cost effective and more convenient potentially than gas guzzling cars. Indicator number six, employment. The job growth numbers for April 2021 were far worse than expected. Analysts expected or hoped that we would have at least 1 million new jobs added in April as part of the rebound from the end of the pandemic. But unfortunately, only 266,000 jobs were added in April 2021. And at the same time, as there seems to be unemployment or a lack of job growth, we are seeing some companies complain about the lack of being able to find workers willing to work. And some of these employers are arguing that the enhanced unemployment benefits are hurting their ability to hire workers. Because if a worker makes $600 a week typically in his job, and then he's getting $600 a week in unemployment benefits for doing nothing and just sitting on his couch, why would he get up and go work to get the same amount of money? Other people argue that this may just be a symptom of the employer not paying their workers enough, and that if they were willing to pay a fair wage, then they would have no problem hiring workers. And it is more accurate to say, I can't find a worker at this wage than to just simply say, I can't find a worker because most people are willing to do almost any job for a high enough wage. And regardless of what the underlying reasons are for these disappointing job growth numbers, inability to hire workers does tend to lead to higher wages, which does tend to lead to higher prices. So this does seem like an indicator that bodes for further inflation to come. Our seventh and final indicator is the price of Arizona iced tea. This is a fun indicator and it is only representative of one brand and one product, but the fact that the price of an Arizona iced tea rose from 99 cents in 2019 to $1.29 in 2020 is pretty startling. That's an increase in over 30%. And Arizona iced tea is this company that has always prided itself in maintaining its price of 99 cents. They have printed that on the label, 99 cents, and that's been part of their long-term marketing strategy. So the fact that they have had to raise prices by as much as 30%, at least for some locations, shows that the underlying costs of aluminum, of other parts of their supply chain are getting higher. Now let's get into the future scenarios. Let's talk about the worst case scenario. Worst case scenario. 
The worst case scenario is that we do hit a tipping point and experience runaway inflation. This has happened many times before. It happened in Zimbabwe, in Greece, in Weimar, Germany, in Hungary after World War II, where prices doubled every 15 hours. And if you think about what this would be like, imagine waking up in the morning, going to a coffee shop, and the price of a coffee is literally $100. That would be pretty jarring. And it would make you start to reconsider how much should you charge for your work. And everyone is trying to figure out what's the right price to charge. And it seems like pretty quickly, people would need to adjust. And I think it's likely that people would start to immediately accept Bitcoin instead, and they would find other ways to adjust. So even in the worst case scenario, when there is this period of potential pandemonium, rioting, looting, I think that the technological tools and the interconnectedness that we have today would make it a smoother transition than we've seen in prior examples of runaway inflation. The other big difference between these inflation examples and what we're experiencing now is that in none of these other examples did the countries involved control the world's reserve currency. That is something unique to the United States. There are other reserve currencies, but the US dollar is still the primary one. And that may lead to a scenario where it is more far reaching when eventually there is runaway inflation, but it also might be more gradual because the entire world has to adjust. It's not just one particular country or one isolated area. Now let's get into the best case scenario. Best case scenario. The best case scenario is that the numbers reported by the US Bureau of Labor Statistics are correct and that inflation is indeed 4% for the year 2021. And even in this best case scenario, 4% is higher than we would like it to be. It's still something to keep an eye on. But 4% is not so bad in and of itself, if that is the true inflation number. And so the question becomes, in the best case, is it possible for the US dollar to maintain its dominance as the global reserve currency and avoid a runaway inflation scenario? We may very well avoid a runaway inflation scenario, meaning it happens more gradually, so it can't necessarily be considered runaway inflation. But even in the best case, it's hard for me to imagine the US dollar still being the world's reserve currency 20 years from now. So maybe for the next 10 years, maybe for the next 15 years, we keep our position in the world. But it seems pretty inevitable that eventually people will switch to alternative currencies, whether it's national digital currencies, whether it is a neutral digital currency like Bitcoin, or whether it's an amalgamation of various national or digital currencies. The other challenge in the best case scenario is that we've already accumulated so much debt and we've already gone so long without the dollar being tied to any type of gold standard or anything like that that it is hard to come back from the brink. It's not impossible, but it would require a total shift to sound money, meaning we stop spending more than we earn each year, and we actually have a surplus as a nation. It would mean closing tax loopholes. It would mean being more efficient with our military budget. And it would mean sacrificing growth and probably sacrificing a lot of politicians' reelections in order to make the economy more stable and more sound. All right, now let's discuss the most likely scenario. Most likely scenario. The most likely scenario in my mind is that inflation numbers are higher than what the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics are reporting. I think the problem is getting to a point where it's pretty dire. I also think we are going to avoid any type of Mad Max apocalyptic scenario because never before in history have we had a new global financial system ready to replace the current global financial system. And I can tell you personally, if I woke up tomorrow and there was a $100 cup of coffee, I would immediately require all of my clients pay me in Bitcoin. I would start to transact with Bitcoin or perhaps with other types of digital currencies that aren't tied to any dollar. And it would be a pretty quick transition. It almost seems like a race for the crypto space to mature enough to make the transition as smooth as possible. Because if it happened today, there would be some serious fear, uncertainty and doubt. There would be some probably some rioting, some areas where there's some violence. But pretty quickly, people would transition to this new decentralized crypto economy. And I feel very bullish about what's going to happen for the entire 80 plus year period after this new transition occurs. Let's talk briefly about how to protect yourself against inflation and which assets might be the best hedge. 
If we look at what happened during the great inflation of the 1960s through the 1980s, we can see that the best performing assets were precious metals like gold and silver, it was oil and gas, it was agriculture, it was mining stocks. All the best performing assets relied on raw materials where there was a very clear limit. And I think this is a good lesson in general when we think about how to hedge against inflation. Think about the things that people have always needed from time immemorial. People need food, they need shelter, people need clean water, people need public utilities. Also long-term stocks that are clearly going to still be around 10 years from now, regardless of what happened, are a good hedge in the long term. So for instance, Disney is still going to be around 10 years from now. Probably 50 or 100 years from now, people are still going to be watching whatever the latest version of Star Wars is. And I think also the fan companies, even though tech changes pretty quickly, the big tech giants right now, Facebook, Apple, Amazon, Netflix, Microsoft, Google, they are clearly in a position of strength. And so I would bet on them in the long run. And of course, Bitcoin, digital gold, I think if that is what ends up replacing the global financial system, that could seriously go to $1 million per Bitcoin. Ethereum is also a great bet. Also, the altcoins that may end up being the top transactional cryptocurrency are a decent bet. And then lastly, art tends to be a good hedge. Art tends to hold its value over the long term. And even when there are major cataclysmic events, people still will love a Van Gogh painting, for instance. And now there's also NFTs, which are a lot more volatile. But still, if you have an artist or creator that has long-term fans, you can be pretty sure that it's going to hold its value over time, whether it's Van Gogh or Beeple. And of course, before you do any type of aggressive investing, it's always good to max out your retirement fund, your Roth IRA, traditional IRA, or 401k. We are in crunch time right now as a nation. We are in the fourth turning of the cyclum, meaning that 80 years ago, there was World War II. 80 years before that, there was the Civil War. 80 years before that, there was the Revolutionary War. So about every 80 years, due to the long-term debt cycle, we tend to have a reckoning and we have to implement a new system. But this time, the world is so connected. We already have global reserve currency. We already have global internet. And now we're building a decentralized version of the global financial system. So I think this transition is going to end up benefiting society and humanity on the whole. As a final message, regardless of what type of inflation we experience in the future, it's always important to remember that this too shall pass. We're talk about what has I think that's a good place to end it. Thank you for tuning in, and, what will and I'll see you next happen. week. The past, the present, and the future. Present.